Uh, Inspirosoft has worked as a code dev lead games designer on both Rainbow Six Siege and Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I get two claps. You do get okay. two claps. So, uh, let me welcome them to the speech design and programming, the best of frenemies. That's us. That okay, so I'm Steve and this is Ben. Hello. No relation. We're going to kick right through into the slides now with who are we? Who are we and where are we yeah. from? So I'm going to go first. I am the uh, lead game designer at Sparrowsoft. Before that, I worked at Traveler's Tales on a selection of the Lego games. Lego, Batman, Harry Potter, Chima, movie, etc. Uh, I've been the game industry now for almost nine years. Uh, at Sparrowsoft, I've worked as introduced to Rainbow Six and Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Working at Traveler's Tales, I started at the junior design level and worked my way up to uh, game director, then I moved to be lead game designer at Sparasoft now. Yeah, and I've been uh, in the industry for 10 odd years. Uh, I've worked on several things. I started in QA, worked my way up through design and then into programming and now into what we call technical design, which is kind of what we're here to talk about. Um, and apparently I'm old, cranky, and nearly bald, but Steve <laughs> wrote this slide, so that's, uh, that's him. Yes. So uh, Ben and I have worked together at uh, two companies now. We've known each other for how long? Five, five years? Five, six years. Something like that. Indeed. So Ben, with his programming background, will be representing the technical experts, and I myself, as the lead game designer, will be representing the creative side of the industry. So let's move on to what our talk is about. So the, press it again. There we go. Yeah. yeah. So here, uh, game design represents the creative vision of the game. Whenever a game is being made, and especially in the AAA industry, there is always a, a plan that has to be followed. We drive the projects. And I am representing the, uh, the engineering side, the technical, what actually goes into building the projects, what is required to make a game actually function, and how we get the ideas from his brain into my computer. Indeed, you might say that a game starts with design and ends with programming. So in order to make a game, both sides have to work together in tandem, but both sides have different priorities and different skill sets that have to work together, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Is it? It is. Oh. <laughs> so the main thing we're going to be talking about here is the inevitable friction created by the two priorities of the creative vision and the technical experts. Now, obviously, uh, in the game industry, although we in AAA, there's due to be these polarized team roles. In actuality, most of us have a mix of skill sets. So Ben, for example, has worked as a designer and has a creative brain in his head, and I have some technical skills. However, in the context of this talk, I will be representing the pure creative vision, and then we be representing the technical expertise side of things. Yeah, just the, the technical, and then we hopefully will, by the end, you'll kind of feel like we've, we've covered a merge between the two. We'll see how we get there. Um, but I think we'll cover some points that you'll find familiar as we go through. Indeed. Our main goal is to kind of uh, dispel the myths that these two departments and disciplines have about each other. So after this uh, slide, we're going to move into some clarifications about the nature of what we're talking about and our experience and how that fits into this talk. So first of all, let's have a look at essentially some disclaimers. On the next slide, we're about to get a bit spicy, a bit controversial, talking about how design and programmers see each other in the worst case scenarios. So to start off, let's clarify some context about what we're talking about here. While we make these broad stroke statements, we're going to try and uh, balance that with some kind of personal experience. At least by the end. So the first one is that our observations are based on AAA development mostly. Um, I think we both felt as we were writing this that when you've got smaller companies, startups, indie companies, it's, you've got a lot more people in hybrid roles doing multiple jobs. We work and have worked primarily in AAA where the jobs are much more clearly Separated from the polarized. You know, polarized, good. Yeah, the, the hierarchy in AAA due to the size of the team tends to put a firm division between the creative and the technical. Whereas, of course, in Indy, like we said, there'd be more of a mix of skills. Uh, additionally, we're going to be talking about a vision led hierarchy. Again, in a more flatland uh, hierarchy, you would have a lot of people involved in the creative vision. People from all departments would be involved in the creative decision making. And although that may be true in AAA, there's usually a veto holder. There's a person or a department, a creative director or the CEO who's making the final call and all the creative vision for the project. And usually it's their responsibility to establish at the start of the project what the team is going to be doing, creating the workload, the requests and the assets, and then reviewing that content as it comes in. So this refers mostly to a hierarchy where someone is in charge of what the game is going to be. In this case, we're representing game design. We do, as we kind of said, by the end, we, we will get to talking about the space between the two. We'll start off with quite a clear separation. 
uh, and you may feel that, that we're not kind of covering that, that crossover between, between the two jobs. We will get there, so we just want to reassure you of that one. But first, we felt it was important to address some of the, the, the big things, and the next slide will kind of show you what we mean by that, uh, between the two, the two separate roles first. Indeed. And the last uh, disclaimer I'm going to use here is that these problems are things that we have seen and experienced ourselves multiple times from talking to our friends and other studios across the game industry, from working in all the different projects we have, the different teams and studios we have. Although the, uh, the range of people and the personalities and the philosophy of the company will continually evolve, uh, there's always these common trends and experiences that keep coming up for us. So again, I want to be very clear at this point that all of you are complex, nuanced people. You've got a different mix of skills and experience, and no one person is a stereotype. However, for the purposes of this, we find that the department that you're in requires you've got a certain uh, priority and focus on a certain part of the project. You're going to have different uh, like interests and tools you have to use, and therefore what you, you value in the project is going to change. So as we go through and make these broad stroke statements, we want you all to be aware that we are talking purely in a kind of a, a trend point of view. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Let's get spicy on the next slide. Come on. If we actually get there. Okay. So the sins is what we decided to call these. And I think I'm glad you're uh, laughing. I'm glad yeah, you're laughing. Yeah, laughter is good. Laugh. Don't yeah. throw things. <laughs> We're trying to establish a lighthearted tone for this because I know that some of these things could seem uh, condescending or cynical, but I, we think these are the true experience. If you go down the pub at the end of the day and you, you vent about your colleagues, you know that people aren't as simple as these problems, but that you've all, I think we've all had these complaints, and I hope that if you don't recognize having this problem yourself, that perhaps you've heard it from someone else, or you're thinking about the other side of the equation going, yep, you're totally right about the programmers. Yeah. So... Design sin. So what do, 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 does the design department do? What do designers do that programmers get annoyed about? There, there we you go. go. That's the first one. <laughs> it's resonating already. Designers don't understand how things work. As we said, you know, these are broad suggestions, but it's a pretty common thing. Designer, oh, we'll do this. Programmer, no. No, we can't have that. Uh, why? It's impossible. And we'll get to that word later <laughs> as well. But it's a common thing. Coders can feel, and I've felt myself working with designers, that they don't understand the game. They don't understand what's going on inside the game, and they're asking for things without knowing that. I think your second one's up there already. Yeah, oh, there you know, it is. There it is. Don't consider the cost of requests. So when they do ask for things, not just do they not understand what they're asking for, but they don't understand how much that's going to cost, not just in terms of money, but in terms of time, in terms of manpower, in terms of everything. Don't provide clear instructions, so they don't understand how things work, they don't consider the costs, and the design document's got holes in it. <laughs> These are all things that, that I've seen, and I can see a few heads nodding, which is reassuring, yes, all the coders out there going, oh, designers. So, uh, yeah, next, next one, please, Steve. Coming up. Unreliable and change their minds. So, again, it's, this is part of, part of creating a game, but you, you slave away on your code for two weeks creating the most wonderful system, and then the designers go, mm, let's make it green. And uh, turns out making it green is really hard. So um, I think it's the last one on the design side. I'm going to take a guess here. Is I think, yeah, it one is. One more? Is no, oh, one more. Oh, no hard skills. So There's more things I, wrong with us. kind of covered in the previous ones, but it, it, the, the idea that the designers don't really have the ability to sit down and actually make something that contributes to the game as an ongoing process. It's all documentation and then down the pub and not worrying about the coders left at home, at home at work making the... Uh, the game. <laughs> you like a husband-wife relationship there. Yeah. I feel all <laughs> these things quite strongly. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. So that's, uh, we were all kind of nodding along with Ben there. So hopefully there's some designers in the room, but back me up in these no, programming you're wrong complaints. About these. <laughs> okay. So the first one for programming, they exaggerate the cost. We don't, in their view, understand the cost. We believe they're overreacting and they are worrying too much about something that will work out just fine. Yes. There's a laughter. <laughs> uh, they let personal agendas affect their valuation. So not only are they intimidated unnecessarily by requests, but also you think you don't like my idea. That's why you're saying it's going to take three months. It's not because my idea is bad. You just don't like it. It's not your cup of tea. And sometimes we blame <laughs> the feedback on that, uh, which leads to the feeling of like, you just don't want to do the work that I want to do. You don't really want to change the face of the industry the way that I do. You're not as ambitious as I am. You don't love the game as much as I do. And... 
these, again, are very extreme. You've all kind of laughed and nodded. You've all experienced these feelings. What we're going to talk about here is, although these are obviously extreme, and we all know that our colleagues aren't as simple as this, we're going to address these problems one by one, talk about the responsibilities and the priorities of each department. I hope we create some kind of empathy and understanding between the two departments. Our goal is that both programmers and designers will look at each other and go, oh, I didn't realize you felt that way. So we're going to cut a lot... Yes, indeed. We're, create, we're, we're going for world peace here, basically. That's yeah, that's goal. what we're going for by the end yeah. of this presentation. World peace. Okay, so let's move on to the design of responsibilities. Here you go. Okay, so when we were thinking about this, why these, these sins exist, why do people think about you know, these two departments have this? What we kept coming up against was the idea that these two departments, they're both dedicated to the same job. They're both trying to make the game, and they both want to make the game as good as it can be. Otherwise, you know, why are we here? Um, but they see the game in two very different ways. A designer sees a flow. The designer's concern is, what is the flow? What's the, the moment-to-moment -moment experience of the player from the moment they start playing the game to the moment they stop? And that's a linear progression of events. An engineer doesn't see that. An engineer sees a mechanism. So where a designer sees a succession of levels with enemies that are placed in certain place, you know, locations and are certain strengths and have certain tools provided to deal with them, a coder sees a lot of the same code being executed again and again in different situations. It's not a linear series of events. It's the same stuff happening over and over and over again. And those two different viewpoints change the way and the, the attitude to developing the game. And they can create some, some quite interesting collisions when you're trying to uh, come up with ideas, you're trying to execute things, you're trying to build a priority list, and you're trying to, to put together the experience, and you're, you're discussing what the experience is going to be at the beginning of development. Indeed. So I'm going to answer the question now of what do designers actually do on a team. So as Ben so graciously mentioned earlier, designers don't create content for the game. At least at my level, I've gone to a high enough part in the team now where I don't even touch the editor in most of our projects. I mostly just manage the team that does. I review their work. So assuming you do have a designer that has no hands-on tasks in the game, what, are they, what is their responsibility? It's a pretty good uh, job to have the ideas person, but they have a, a role to play as well, and often they don't do it fully because it's, it's very difficult. So a designer's job is to communicate to the team what they need for the game. They're communicating to a lot of different departments, and all their pieces that they make has to work together for the final product. So our job is to give a very clear idea to not just what everyone's making, but why they're making it. So unfortunately, while doing this, while working through the experience the player is going to have, it is almost inevitable they make some mistakes. They leave gaps. And this isn't because they are, they're slacking or apathetic or not paying attention. It's actually very difficult to think through every step of every system. So some things that can go wrong along the way of making one of these specifications for a feature or a product is, uh, first of all, not thinking of all the assets that are required. So I often do uh, a talk about how to be good at game design, and one of the first students and such. And one of the major things that I do is I talk about an example of a dog digging up a bone. And I ask the audience, what do you need to make this dog dig up a bone? So you don't just need the dog model and the bone. You might need some VFX for the dirt, you need the sound of the barking, the animation of entering to dig up the bone. you got to think about uh, the... The animation to the dog whenever it succeeds, you've got to think about the, uh, the dirt mound is digging up itself, and you've got to think, how big is the bone? You've got to define each of these things. What type of dog is it? What kind of dirt is it? And then after that, you move into the flow, and people say, okay, it's going to be in a game multiple levels. Do I need different types of dirt for the city level and the sewer level? Do I need to have multiple dogs in this game? Are we going to have to have this uh, feature applicable to multiple dog models? Or perhaps... Uh, does this dog, whenever it digs up the bone, does the bone, has it got a chance of falling off an edge? So literally, in this case, an edge case, a very small likelihood in the game that can occur for some players and then therefore must be accounted for for all players. So for example, if I say a dog can dig up a bone and that bone falls in an area the player can't get, do we need a bone respawning system? And it's very easy not to think about all these potential avenues and variables that could affect your game. So it's pretty easy for a flow to have holes in it. The real problem comes whenever you ha have those holes, people bring them to you, and you get defensive. I'm going to talk a bit about that a bit more later on. Uh, one big thing that uh, designers do often say is, well, I've thought about this plan, and yes, I didn't tell you what kind of dog it was, but isn't it obvious? It's my favorite All type of dog. Time. It's a spaniel. Or obviously, it's a normal human-sized bone. 
to be a dinosaur's head. What if the dog is bones. digging on concrete? Oh, I thought it was obvious dogs can't dig on concrete. It's not real concrete, designer. Yeah. It's a game. So the, the question becomes, I thought that was obvious. Why wouldn't you use your common sense to fill that gap? Microphone just going a bit, a bit there. Common sense. Common sense is a phrase that drives me up the wall. Um, you, you do hear it a lot. I think it was obvious. Use common sense. Fill in the gaps for yourself. But it's, it's, it's a, a hole. It's a, it's a trap. And I think the programmers in the room would probably agree with me that when you use your common sense to fill in a hole in a design document, that just basically means you're going to be rewriting your code in a week's time. It, a designer's job is, is to communicate. And Steve is right. It is extremely difficult to write a design document that covers everything that makes sure that you, you have all of the edge cases solved. But as a programmer, it is not our job to, to fill in those gaps. And having to go and chase designers or trying to fill gaps in themselves just, just results in wasted time and wasted, wasted effort. And, and this is where kind of we, we get to the point where designers and, and, and coders have to kind of work, work together. And we kind of cover this again in, in, in a bit. We're getting there. Um, the assumption is that everyone has a frame of reference. I'm just not using the right words. You're just skipping the slide just, completely. Just skipping the slide and moving, moving straight on. Assumption, assumption is a risk. Yeah, the, all of this stuff, where, when, when it comes to, to writing code, when it comes to trying to create something from a document that was written by someone else, if any, any assumptions that you make are going to be a risk to having to, to rewrite things, to having to, uh, to waste time, any, everyone has their own frame of reference. What, what you're imagining, while the designer may think it's obvious, it, it is not necessarily the same thing, and it's not just cosmetic stuff. Sometimes, to go use the dog with the bone example, you know, what happens if the bone falls out of out of the reach of the player? Um, I'm, I'm picturing a very specific dog, and it's a very specific bone as well. I've got like a clip art image in my head yeah. that I've not given to you. No, and you know, I'm picturing a completely different a different set of events, and and it's. Impossible. It's impossible. It's so difficult to describe, and it's so easy to fall into the, the trap of kind of going, oh, well, just, just write it. But in the end, no, you can't just write it. It needs to be specified. Yeah, another thing is also when the bone is dug up, whenever it comes out of that hole, is that a set animation, or do I need a physics system to drive the bone? How far in the air does the bone go when it lands on the floor? Does it bounce? All of these things. So, you, you know, this is a very simple example, and we've just, well, Steve's just listed off sort of 20 different variables, and if we sat here, I'm sure we could come up with another 50 without any problems. This last point is, is a very important one, and it's one that designers fall into all the time, and not just designers. Coders can fall into this trap, as can artists, animators, producers, everything. The assumption that because something works in a single way in the real world, it works in that way in a video game. The, the ball bouncing is the one that I like, because we all assume gravity is, is an absolute. We live in gravity every single day. We assume that if we let go of something, it will fall to the ground. It doesn't, why would that happen in a video game? Unless you've coded gravity, gravity doesn't exist. Nothing exists. There is, there is nothing. It's just maths. So never assume that just because something is obvious because it happens in the real world, it actually applies to the game that you're making. They told me to take the gifts out, but I put them back in. For you, Nadia. <laughs> we, ha we had to have this one. It's too good. So we mentioned earlier about designers getting defensive. So whenever you've got this document, as I said, it is inevitable there's going to be holes in it. And the problem is that a lot of young, medium, and even some high-level designers can forget that uh, they are fallible humans. And they worry about how they come across to their team. And then the team comes in with these holes, and they say, you didn't think about this, this, and this. And you go, whoa, you calling me stupid or something? I feel, you know, I feel like you're coming after me. I feel attacked. And it could be because your idea, when you make it, it's, very, it's, a, it's an idea. It's a kind of a dream you have. And um, when people come to you and criticize it, even if they're pointing out actual holes that's your job to fill, it can feel like an attack upon your creativity and your ability as a designer. Especially if you are in a purely creative role, it's hard to justify yourself to people who have visible talent that they can show you, like an artist or an animator or a coder. And yes, as a designer, you feel a lot of pressure to lead the team. You are the vision holder, and therefore, you set the morale of the team and the stability of your leadership. And whenever people come to you with a problem, you think, oh, well, if I fold now, it's going to look like I'm indecisive, like I'm not, I'm not, you know, feel strong enough about my ideas, I'm not attached to these things. But in fact, uh, I mentioned to all your designers out there, uh, your team will appreciate it much more if you listen to them and you're flexible. But at the time, you can kind of shell up and worry about how you come across. If someone comes to you with a problem, you go, Oh yeah, I didn't think about that. Never mind. 
you know, you look like you're, you're flippant and you're not thinking it through. So some tips, learn that phrase. I didn't think of that. Very important phrase. Mm, I don't know yet. Or I didn't know that. Actually, that's new information you brought me because you were an expert in your field and I didn't think about that yet. And it, it's, it's, Sorry, it's so easy to, to not want to say I don't know or I didn't know that, to feel that, that that's admitting failure and defeat and that you're going to be judged. But you can't know everything. And we work in the business of making new stuff. Every game, everything. What's new about this game? What's brand new? What has no one done before? How can you know what's not been done? And as I said earlier, a team will actually appreciate a leader who can adapt. And further to that, uh, not everybody's thinking about you all the time. A designer or a programmer dealing with a task is going to be thinking, how am I coming across in this situation in this meeting? But actually, everyone's thinking that. No one's thinking, wow, this particular designer isn't giving me what I need in this moment. They're thinking about their task and how it's being affected by the decisions they're making. So I would recommend letting the ego down a little bit and realizing, oh, I'm not being judged all the time. It's actually my performance across the entire job, not every individual task where I can perform and show people I can do my job. That's where we had the point saying, no one is ever thinking about you as much as you think they're thinking about you. Okay. The programming perspective. So I've been talking so, there about how the designer feels in that process, and Ben's going to talk now about how the programmer feels. The same thing can be true on the programming side. Everyone is, is defensive when it, it comes to, to their work. No one wants to feel like they've failed to do something or that they're being criticized or that the work that they're doing isn't being recognized as, as quality, as good. We're all I, mean, I, feel, I feel pretty judged right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just <laughs> loads of people looking at us going, be good at this. <laughs> Terrifying. Uh, programmers do tend to be detail-oriented people, and we don't, uh, we don't like to make statements about things. We don't like to guess, is what I'm going for here. We, if someone says, you know, a designer kind of says, oh, well, you know, we want, we want X thing, we want a dog digging up a bone, then as a programmer, my, my first response is, okay, well, I want to go and have a look at the, the code that we have. I want to look at animation systems. I want to look at attractor systems. I want to look at volume uh, collision systems. I want to, to look at what we have to see if I can provide you what it is you're asking for. Or maybe, maybe our collision systems aren't quite precise enough. Maybe our attractor system isn't quite precise enough. Maybe we need more diverse support for dynamic animations. All of that stuff I want to know. But until this meeting, I didn't know we wanted a dog digging up a bone. And now I've got a designer and a producer and a couple of artists and a bunch of people staring at me and saying, can we make this happen? And my response is... Maybe. Ma maybe. Yeah. Or no. <laughs> as the case and how be. often have your coders said, maybe? Yeah. I don't know. We mentioned here about the, uh, the kind of attention to detail that programmers have. They find all the holes because they actually have to implement this stuff. They have to bring it down to reality. I read an article a little while ago about a game. I won't mention the name, but it's a science fiction shooting game where uh, after it came out, someone dug into the, some of the scripts, some of the files. It's an any file. An any file. An any configuration file with a spelling mistake in it. And a spelling mistake in it. And because of that spelling mistake, the AI were not pathing correctly. They were not attaching to the nodes the designer had laid down for them. So one letter broke an entire system, and that came out to release with that broken system because it was too subtle to notice. So if one letter can change everything for a programmer, it's no wonder they're coming after me for not knowing what size of bone that I want. It's also a really good... Really good example of check your find and replace after you've done it. Yeah. So programming tasks are unpredictable. I think we can, we can sort of move through these, Steve. Um, but this is the same sort of thing. You know, we, it's difficult to know at any time. None of your, no, no coders, unless you're working on something very small, no individual coder holds the entire code base in their head. That's, that's crazy. This is thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of code. So your coders need time. We need to go and have a look and see how how things work. And yeah, if you ask a, a coder to make a decision about something on the spot without the opportunity to research and look this stuff up, they're going to play it safe because otherwise they're risking the project. So if you ask for you know, the entire world, they'll probably say no, unless you know, you've given them the time and you've talked it through and you've actually done the research that needs to be done. Designers have the, the benefit of, of everything being in their own brains. Um, and it's actually, yeah, uh, it's probably very selfish of me, but I didn't even think about that until we talked to Ben about this for, in preparation for this Terrible. presentation, Awful. is that a programmer would feel intimidated by my request. They would be, they'd be worried they couldn't do something, and that was why they were getting defensive about what I wanted them to achieve. I just assumed everyone is just infinitely perfect at their job. Yeah. But everyone worries about their job. That's why it's so, so bad to work with you. It's <laughs> 
So uh, to end this slide, uh, I added this line for myself. So designers, uh, have they ever soft skills uh, set? Their job is management and communication. So inevitably, they're always thinking about the morale of the team. Whereas other departments don't usually take their share of the responsibility in that process. For example, managing the tone of a meeting room. They're in there to get a task, and therefore they don't feel the same responsibility to make sure that everyone is comfortable and happy in that room. So a point that I would make is that it would be great for programmers to also be able to express themselves and say, I don't know, actually. I'd rather go look at it. And some programmers who are more experienced will tell you that. And it's very important you listen to that. And again, this is where the phrase, I don't know, comes back in. It, as a programmer, I remember when I started and I, you know, saying, I don't know, felt really, really intimidating. felt like I'd failed at my job. But it really is OK to, to say to your designers, you know what? I don't know. Give me half an hour. Give me 10 minutes. And how many coders here have looked at a, a, a design request and gone, oh, I'm not sure about that, and then gone back to their computers and gone, oh, no, I'll take five minutes. Which is a perfect yeah. segue into our new slide, which I already put up it there. It is. Sorry. That's impossible, <laughs> even for a computer. So this is an alternative thing you can say. Instead of saying, oh, I don't know yet, you say, no, that's actually impossible. So my question is, Ben, is it impossible? It's not impossible. I used to bullseye womp rats in my T16 back home. <laughs> uh, <laughs> impossible is... Is, it, it's never impossible. Impossible is a word that is used to mean, I don't think that that's really a good idea, either creatively or technologically or whatever. Impossible, I, again, we come back to, this is a computer. Pretty much anything that you want to achieve can be achieved as long as your development goals and your technology has been structured correctly. Yes, there are still some things, you know, if you want, you know, real AI in your game, you probably don't have any, any overhead to actually do visuals. And there are things that are out of the range of the machines that we have right now, but that gap is closing rapidly. And if you compare it to just five years ago, the machines that we have are, are incredibly powerful and capable. So really, if you want to make something in your video game, of course it's possible. The question is, what does your technology currently do? What can your coders achieve? And what, what complements the game? Is it a good idea? So, yeah, I, coders, and I've been guilty of this in, in the past, and I, I think most coders probably have, saying, oh, no, that's impossible, when what we mean is that's really, 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 really hard. You've, you know, you've just asked for something that goes against our entire shader pipeline. But the question in the end of do we rewrite the shader pipeline isn't yours to answer as a coder. It's the designer's. I've made some pretty ambitious requests in my time. And I find that uh, whenever I dug into it with the coder, what happened was they'd done the math in their head. They'd gone, this is how much man hours and time and changes we're going to require to achieve that. And, I, and they think, it's stupid. That's a stupid idea. So it's, it's impossible. You would never say yes to this. So as a designer, how can you negotiate past that, that wall when a task is so intimidating? So some advice for me, designers in the room, to discuss it with your programmers and how to do that. First of all, don't try and tell them how to do it. This is a mistake I used to make when I was a younger designer. I had seen similar systems in the past, and I would say, hey, well, look, that exists. Why not just do it this way? Or I'd be semi-familiar with the way that a feature would be implemented previously, and I would say, well, why don't you do this but that? And that's a mistake, because when you say how, programmers normally assume that it is part of the specifications to work that way. And this is where we get designers don't know how things work. <laughs> Indeed. But we sometimes know just a little bit enough to be dangerous. That's the problem. Enough to be dangerous, yes. yes. Uh, the other thing is, they've done the math in their head, as I've said. Ask to see that math. Why is it so ridiculous? They can tell you, they can break down, oh, it's ridiculous because it's going to take us four or five months and 20 people, you know? Or perhaps we have to cut all these features from the game to make that work, or we have to swap engine. But here's the thing. It is entirely possible that you want to do that, that you're willing to do that as the as a leader of the project or the company owner, perhaps you are willing to do that ridiculous thing. We had an anecdote that we're going to skip because I think we're getting short on time a little bit. Quick, yeah. But uh, and, and very short, basically, uh, the matrix, bullet time, all those cameras. Think about how much effort it took to create that effect of a camera moving around a person. How many people must have interrupted and said, why not use less cameras? Why not have less angles, a shorter shot? Why not have a normal camera spinning around? Why not animate it? But they said, no. We want this system with a million cameras. How many cameras? Yeah. Oh, oh, well, it depends on the shot. But there's 150, 200 cameras, still cameras. And the Wachowski said to Warner Brothers, no, we, we need to do this. And they ended up with one of the most iconic sequences yeah. in cinema history. But on paper, ridiculous. Some buildings out there, weird shapes. Some architects were like, build this. The builders went, why? 
Why don't I just make it a square? Squares exist, you know? This so, is where the creative has, has power over the, the technical. Indeed. Perhaps I want to make that sacrifice. So ask to hear the math. The next thing is, ask for the core goals. You give a task, you give all the details, but perhaps you only want to achieve a very particular thing. I worked on a game, uh, Lego Marvel as Avengers on the handhelds on 3DS, and we wanted to do open world, the same scale as the cities in the console version. And whenever I asked the programmers that, they were like, again, that's impossible, that's ridiculous. But I said, listen, okay, you're assuming that I want to have all the same features, the same variety of traffic and pedestrians and missions in the world. I want two things, the scale, and the ability to move through it at speed. I have to be able to fly through it. So the speed of loading and the size of the world was what was important. And the artist came to me and they said, it's going to be ugly. We can't do it pretty. And I said, well, look, that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. I was willing to, to have a lower budget for the art in order to make the world load faster because the experience of flying was more important than the art detail. But they had assumptions attached to what it was meant to be like. Another example I want to give for the next one is uh, compromises. They were surprised I was willing to compromise on the fidelity of the world. They thought that was a necessary part of the idea. But I went, no, I will compromise on that. I, we also worked in a game uh, as a AAA shooter, which you can't talk about in detail. But essentially, we wanted to do uh, an ability where you could create a copy of yourself. And originally, we said we wanted a copy of the character. And the programmers, the tech team went, that you can't have more characters on screen. We're maxed out. The budgets will not allow it. No more characters. That's impossible. We can only have these many characters. Yes, that was a problem. I said characters, and characters have a lot of assumptions attached to them. They have to have a certain amount of AI and animation, and they have to have shadows, and they've got multiple textures and meshes. Whatever I said, no, it can be completely static. It can be locked, one costume, it can just be... A st single shader, single mm -hmm. mesh, no animation, no inventory, no AI. Strip all of these things away, and suddenly you've got something that to the player looks like a copy of a character, but actually is just an empty shell. It became possible. So I found ways to compromise to make that happen. So if you're having a discussion with a programmer, find out the cost, maybe you're willing to pay it, but maybe you can reduce that cost massively by prioritizing the core things and compromising the stuff they assumed was obvious. In that case, it was my language. I'd use the word character. And again, detail, terminology matters to programmers, maybe not so much to me. But uh, to them, a character is a very specific object in the game. Well, well one spelling mistake can screw everything up. Detail is important. So uh, the last two, very similar. I'm going to talk about this in more detail shortly. But uh, essentially, give your programming team time. As Ben said earlier, making a decision in the room is very uncomfortable for programmers. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. Time. Yes. And uh, in terms of uh, making a prototype, that's the next step. You know, we make it, try it. Do yeah, prototyping. I, I'm guessing there's no one in the room is going to disagree when I sort of say prototyping is so important, it's ridiculous. Design documents are, are good, mm -hmm. and it's nice to have them, but until you reach the prototype stage, you're not seeing how that design is going to be realized. As a coder, you're not quite seeing how you're going to structure the, the engineering, the, you know, the mechanism behind what it is that you're building, and as a designer, you're not quite seeing how it's going to feel. So the sooner you get to a prototype, the sooner a whole bunch of questions will be answered, and your designer can iterate, and your coder can iterate, and everyone will be happy and get down the pub, which is, of course, the most important thing. And it reduces the intimidation on the side of the programmer as well, which we'll talk about shortly. So that is what you should do in the case of an intimidated programmer. And also, very important point, make sure you, they don't feel that they're being rushed. Make sure that you know that I won't forge ahead with this if you don't convince me not to in the room. If you do that, then that pressure will cause them to say no and be a hard no. You have to keep the conversation going. There we go. So a big problem for programmers is that they, they feel that, that they have to make a decision in the room immediately. So I'm going to slam through this slide a little bit because we are cutting through the time. We've waffled a bit too much. We are waffly. <laughs> Come on. So as I said earlier, it's very important as a designer to sell the why with the what. Give the context of your request. Mention the core goals and the compromises you're willing to make. Make sure that they know what the project is, is going to be. Give them a strong vision to follow. That's true for all departments. Additionally, uh, I've mentioned here about this in the room before. I read an article recently. I think it was in Financial Times or something. I don't know. But it was an article about introverted thinkers. The you concept that for designers, we can make a choice really fast. We can say, yeah, of course, now the dog is a cat. Psh, done. But for a programmer, they have to go away and think of the implications of that change, which is much easier for a designer in the room to change their mind and flow around, whereas programmers have to have some time to consider the impact of those requests. They are not for, for the sake of personality type introverted thinkers, but in terms of they need time literally to process the work. 
It is always the case, designers, that if you think something is easy, it's hard. And if you think it's hard, it's easy. It's just always that way. I don't know why. It's a rule of the universe. And as we know, the worst thing that can happen is for a bad decision to be made by a designer that a programmer has to follow through on. But why do programmers hate these bad decisions so much and they're scared of them happening? Because they're bad decisions. <laughs> so time wasted is, is the biggest thing. As a coder, your time is, is always valuable. I think it's easy to forget for other departments, design, any other department, that when any, any one department other than code is working, code is working. There is nothing in the game that works without code. If you're designing, code is working. If artists are creating stuff, code is working. Animators, code is working as well. So time is, is infinitely valuable. I don't think that I'm telling, that anything, telling you anything new when I say that. But as a coder, you don't want your time to be wasted. You don't want your personal time to get cut into when it comes to, uh, to, to crunching on anything. And you don't want your professional time to be wasted either. It doesn't look great. You don't meet deadlines. And when feeling like you've had to go over the same area, the same code yeah. over and over and over again. I'm going to jump in here as well to talk a bit about crunch. Uh, so it's something that we're aware of in the game industry, that overtime occurs at a lot of studios. I think as designers, you often abdicate your responsibility in creating overtime. But the producers have a lot of methods in place to manage the team and record their workloads. They have their, their schedules and their sprint planning, etc. And because the producers are supposedly there to protect the teams, designers don't think that's not my job then to monitor the workloads of the team. But I think we all are kind of aware when we give a task to someone, they might be biting up more than they can chew and you know it. Sometimes people will take a, a job on a Friday and say, yeah, it'll be done on Monday. I would say as a designer, as a team leader, leading the morale of the team, you must say no to that. You must make it clear to your team. Be verbal about it at the start of a project. Say, I do not support overtime. I don't want you to do any for me. So that people do not choose to spend weekends and evenings trying to complete tasks faster to impress you. Tell you do not want that. That's your responsibility to do that. It's your responsibility to check that you're overloading a department and to be involved in finding solutions for those problems. So I think even as a, a lot of producers have a lot of a role to play in this as a designer, don't think you don't have any responsibility in that. You are creating the workload. You're making these requests. And until a programmer or any other department can negotiate a feature whose complexity with you without being worried that if they lose the battle, they'll be spending their weekends away from their children, then they'll not be able to get a true answer from you. So not just lose the battle, but feel like, like they're fighting against the quality of the game. Feel like the team is going to look at them and go, oh, no, no, you, you just want to do something quickly. You don't want to have to, to worry about the quality of the game. And it's just, you know, if, if you're asking, you know, your animators for, for 10 animations, then a coder is going to have to come along and make sure the animation system supports all of that and the tool chain supports all of that. So if you've created overtime for your animators, your artists, your designers, your sound producers, anyone, you've probably created overtime for a coder as well. And until you have, can have an honest conversation without them having their personal time on the line, you will not be able to get a truly honest answer from them. And I mentioned earlier about exaggerating the cost of requests. It happens because, one, you've not given them time to process it, so they're giving you the worst case scenario. And two, they're trying to defend themselves from the work bleeding into their personal time because they've agreed to something that they don't think they can actually achieve. Okay, let's move back. And I believe now we're talking more about how designers suck again. Yeah, we are. Good. Why do designers change their mind? So I've got a bit of a defense now on the designers, having ragged on them just a little bit. Well, yeah, but yeah. you know. So you all iterate in tasks. Every department does. Every artist presses control Z. They've got erasers. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, again, more GIFs. See? Yeah, the, the people, GIFs are good. The people love the GIFs. Yeah, everyone loves them. Yeah. A designer iterates also. The problem is when a designer iterates, everyone iterates with them. All coders will rewrite a piece of code multiple times before submitting it. That all happens on their computer, so no one ever gets bothered by it. Designers do the same thing, but everybody hears about it. So part of the defense here, although you have to future-proof yourself, which we'll talk about a bit later, it is inevitable that uh, you will have to make some changes and test things. Fail faster is a good approach in game development. Further, there may be a case that someone above you, a studio director or a, a creative director or perhaps a publisher or a client comes to you with a request which filters down changes to your team. And it's bad management to come across and say, it's not me, guys, it's this guy up here because it damages morale for the team to feel that they are following a master they never meet. You have to kind of back and sell that choice from above you. And sometimes it's completely unpredictable. Sometimes you are happy with your design and they come and surprise you with something that you did not see coming. You can protect yourself from that, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, the second thing is uh, requesting other departments, uh, they need things from you as well. So for example, maybe I bring programming some bad news. I say all of the 
animation attachment is going to happen on the handles of the vehicles now. It's all, it's all coded. And the reason I'm doing that is that animation's workload is too high. Oh, I was just going to agree with you. Oh, that good. Was, I was just going to, yes. yes, you I was, come I was with, like, with no, not yet. <laughs> so yeah, be aware that also designers have to manage multiple departments. Just because a change affects you negatively doesn't mean it's not helping someone else who might be in a worse position than you. So designers limiting the impact of changes. Yeah, help me to help you. This yeah, is your bit, yeah. yeah, help me. To, yeah, I was, I was uh, losing my, my place in the slide. So um, yeah, help me to help you. Designers, be sensitive. Be sensitive to morale when passing stuff on. I mean, it is it is a a pretty common sense thing. I think. Oh, I've used that phrase. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> that bad phrase. Assumptions risk, Benjamin. Assumptions are risk. Uh, morale is, is a tricky thing. It's always a tricky thing. And uh, it's very easy to feel like you can't deliver bad news without damaging it. And it's very easy to decide that you don't care and you're just going just gonna to say negative things all the time. And there is a line to walk. Uh, so if you're, you know, you're coming to an engineer and you've got bad decisions, something's been cut, something's been changed, something needs to, to be altered. Just be, you know, think about how that news is going to impact them. Actually be sensitive. Don't just walk up to the desk and go, oh, this thing, this thing's cut. Cut. Bye. Done. Yeah. This whole uh, talks of empathy is listening to your team and thinking about how they feel. Yeah, so. at the end of this, empathy is, is comes across quite strongly. It's just understanding that what you've just done, everything that you've just done has had an impact on the, whoever is, is connected with it. And they will then have an impact on you. So it's very much about sort of not, not how are you feeling, but how is the person that you're talking to feeling? Be a human about it. Talk to your fellow humans as if they are humans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, designers and, and coders, okay, you know, we... You know, Coders, we can kind of come across as slightly scary, crisp, devouring monsters with our headphones. And, uh, well, that's me at least. <laughs> All um, right, we're going to have to push along a little yes, bit, I think. Very... So we get some time for questions, such as, what were you talking about that whole time? Okay, so future proofing, extremely important. So I'm going to nip in here a little bit. Uh, so, future proofing is something designers can do to forecast what potentially will happen to your project. I've got two examples for you here. The first one is if you're working on a system or a feature, it's usually very obvious what might be changed. The be best example is gun balancing, weapon balancing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we all know that, you know, when some stuff goes into the game, you're going you're gonna to move through a design phase, through an engineering phase, and then into a, a design phase again. A testing but, phase, a yeah. A testing phase. And um, when, you're, when you're building a system like a gun, for example, you know that ammo counts, uh, rate of fire, damage per bullet, DPS, all of this stuff is, is going to be changed. Designers are going to want to tweak it. So designers can really help this process by, by laying out the things that they think they're going to want to change. And coders, you can help this process by just looking at things when you're writing it and kind of going, well, that's that's probably going to need to be changed. Especially helpful as technical designers. Yeah, so from my perspective as as technical designer now, most of what I end up doing on a day-to-day -day basis is changing things in, in editors and in tool chains and, and working with that and working with the data to, to tweak things. And a lot of the time, we, we have to sort of go back and, and ask for things to be re-exposed. And what can really help with this when you're building you know, tools and, and engines and, and technology is actually building a... a middleware that allows you to, your, your technical designers, to expose variables coming out of your code without actually having to go back to your coders. An editor for your purpose. engine, right? An editor for your engine, yeah. mm, Indeed. So, and the other thing you can do for uh, future proofing, top tip for designers, if you're working with someone above you, like that creative director or company owner I mentioned, then you can get to know them. You can get to know what they're focused on. I worked with a designer who was obsessed with Rita Fire, and I knew that was the thing most likely to change. So I was able to tell the audio guys, don't do that Rita Fire sound yet, because I know that's going to change. Or you might see someone who is obsessed with like the suspension of a car. That happened once. And uh, it's basically good to kind of prepare yourself for changes that you know will probably come down the pipeline. And if you tell your programmers that's probably going to change, they can make the code more flexible. Is that... Yeah, well, and then this phrase. comes down to, to conversation, lots and lots of conversation and being open and not saying, oh, I can do this or, oh, I don't know how to do this and getting, getting you know, feeling stuck to the idea as soon as it's delivered to you, but actually kind of saying, what about this? What about this? Can we do this? Can we expose this? If we change this bit of it, will that work better? Can we actually have this conversation and not just feel like you're being dictated to? So we mentioned there briefly about uh, forecasting, future proofing. I mentioned about technical designers. So what we're going to do now, as promised, we're going to talk about hybrid roles. People here, half in the design and half in the programming. Well, or at least technical implementation uh, bucket. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to open this slide up, talking about basically designers who work in the editor, probably the most common version of the hybrid. 
uh, which is, I mean, I've done this role myself. Junior designers especially tend to have some kind of editor role. And there are advantages and disadvantages too to this. So one upside is that because you're familiar with the tools, you can actually do your own iterations. I mentioned earlier about exposing variables. You can do all the balancing and tweaking yourself. You don't have to keep going back to the programmer and saying, this car is too fast. Make it slower, please. And you can actually expose it and do it on your own machine and give them the value that you want. Also, you get to see your impact of your changes. So you, all of a sudden, you do understand what you're asking for. Secondly, uh, you show that you can actually do things and contribute to the project. And although perhaps it is unfair, this does improve your uh, standing with the programming community. I think you can, you can maybe disagree with me, but I think programmers think a designer who actually works in the editor and get his hands dirty is somehow slightly more respectable than someone who's a pure pie in the sky yeah. ideas man. I've like, worked in editors. I was in QA once. <laughs> Not here. And a fantastic thing that can happen, uh, which I kind of miss actually, because I don't work in the tools anymore, is by looking at the tools and what they can do, you can actually be inspired to do something new in the game. And that's a huge advantage that I'm sure anyone working in indie right now knows about. You add a feature to your game because you realize, I can achieve that. And unfortunately, whenever you don't have any involvement in the tech, you can't actually be inspired by the tools that you already have. You always end up asking for new things. Some downsides. Uh, unfortunately, because you are slightly informed but not a programmer, you might misuse some terminology, for example. This is a big one when, when someone says, oh, let's just put this in an array. And you go, you don't mean an array, you mean a dictionary. Um, but you don't know what a dictionary is, so we, we know you mean a collection. I, if, you, if you're not sure about, about these things, then just you know, don't, don't use this. Don't, don't say, don't get it. try and use technical <laughs> terms. Just... Just kind of say, oh, we need these things all together in this space. And you, as the person who's done the work and is qualified to understand how these things go together, will let you make those decisions. Designers aren't trained technical experts, so they may be careless or reckless inside the tools. Once you give them some access to the tools, they might be aware of the full implications of what they have changed. Further, uh, although you do not have designers doing iteration, thus reducing the workload of the programmers, usually it creates a brand new department who have to create the tools for the designers to use because they can't use the actual code. We can't handle it. We need friendly interfaces. And then all of a sudden, those interfaces have to be managed all the time. And the importance of tools is an entirely separate presentation. But every time we've done this, I've said this line. If you don't have a tools department, get a tools department. So then it's just, <laughs> just need one. It's done. Okay, cool. And the last type of hybrid, and we're close to the end. We, we, I think we've almost done it. We're only oh, five, almost. Only, I mean, we're, we're only five we're, minutes over. We're five minutes, yeah. That's not too bad. We've got oh, one minute. We're, okay, we're one so minute going left. through. I, a lot of this is covered by, by actually what, what Steve just like, like, flipped through these. I think, Steve. Um, but going the other way, coders who work as designers. I think as, as coders, you know, as we said, time is always sensitive, and it's not always the best use of a coder's time to, to work as, as, as with the designers in the design department. But it can actually be extremely useful to have someone whose primary job is to write code, but who actually works with the editor, works with the designers, and is a point of contact both for designers to talk to the code department and for the code department to talk to the design department. In fact, I, I, some indie developers here might be thinking, why can't programmers do the design? That's what I do. I'm a one-man band. But the reason that the hierarchy is so polarized in AAA is because the teams are so large and there are so many tasks that it's just not feasible to be implementing and designing at the same time at, at a full active level. Certainly as a designer, uh, at a lead level at least, now that I uh, have all these responsibilities to the team, my day is full already. I don't have time to implement things. And time in the editor that I spend, which I do occasionally do, I nip in sometimes, like I'll be away from my actual responsibilities as a lead. So there's not time for me to do both roles. And I think that's why it's so rare to see a, a full programmer spending time doing design documents because they'd be so far away from their actual workload in the, in the AAA hierarchy. I think, I think we can uh, move because we're running out of time. All right, fair enough. <laughs> but, uh, you can yeah. load us up on YouTube and read this slide. Some very good points on there. Uh, there are some, yeah. some good points. and it, it is, it, it, It's kind of in the same area, but it, it's, it's very tempting to think that your coders should just be writing code all the time. And it just can be very useful, actually, to have a coder who's a bit more disconnected and can work with the design department. It does, yeah, the, the, one, the one thing I will say up there is the bottlenecking issue. And yes, anyone's sitting there thinking, oh, but now everything that goes between those departments has to go through one person. That is an issue, and I'll put my hands up to that being an issue. 
but a bottleneck is, is infinitely preferable to a bunch of people all talking to each other about different things in different ways in different times and at different places and everyone not really understanding what on earth is going on. Benjamin Bottleneck Sharples. That, uh, is, that would be my nickname if I yeah. had one. <laughs> okay, and the last slide basically. The point of all this is that video games are a marriage of creative vision and technical expertise. This quote opens uh, a gallery at, in London currently. It's from uh, the director of the NYU Game Center, Frank Lance. And it suggests that video games are an opera built of bridges. It combines architecture and construction with kind of a, a dreamlike, idealistic idea. So, idealistic idea. Write that one down. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> and as such, both these sides have to work together perfectly. And in AAA, with them being so separated, it's important that we understand each other. That's the kind of message here. Have a think about what your designer and your programmer feels. And hopefully, we won't be down at the pub venting like the sin sheet. Yeah, everyone will be down the pub together, drinking heavily like we're supposed to. Are we going to? Yes. Ah. Thank you very much. Thank you.